In the last part, we explored uh, what a temporal database is and what the difference is between a temporal database and a kind of standard uh, snapshot of the current data only. Um, we talked also about history tables and basic mechanisms that we use to keep history uh, in our data stores. And we talked about why we've struggled to kind of have a more holistic approach with SQL uh, by itself. Uh, the research that's been going on has been going on for a long time and we haven't came up with, other than creating history tables and, and things of that nature, um, there hasn't been this kind of, uh, you know, complete solution that, that just fixes everything, right? Just hasn't happened yet. I also want to note, um, you know, as I, as I go into the next part, that the research uh, that I've looked into here, I've only really looked into in the last couple of years uh, to understand this better. Because as a software engineer, I never honestly thought about it this way. I mean, I, I thought about history tables, but I never thought about, you know, at the SQL level, coming up with a global solution uh, to kind of manage uh, data through time uh, at the SQL level, right? That, that never actually occurred to me um, because SQL doesn't, it's not that I, I think it's impossible, I just, SQL itself, you know, doesn't seem to be the right way to do it. You might be able to do it because you can do, you know, different kinds of conditions and stuff and there's enough data types and, um, you know, stored procedures and, and things like that to, to say, you know, create history and, and all that is, is used, but it's very, you know, one-off. It's always created for the particular solution you need. And, I like thinking of things in this, okay, so how do I build this once and then reuse it in every application that I, I want to do? And that is difficult, honestly, or at least it seemed difficult to me. I don't want to preclude that, that there's not a better solution there. So I don't know that, you know, at least the way SQL stands now and the way things are engineered at the moment, I don't know that we're going to see... Um, a, a true like temporal solution that's universal that just gets widely adopted and before you know it um, you know we're, we're still utilizing uh, you know databases the same way still obeying normal form and yet somehow uh, keeping track of time uh, transparently at the SQL level I, I just don't see it happening I see it being engineered for specific solutions and that's what happens today um, so you know I would say four or five years ago, I started thinking about maybe even a little bit more, but I think that's about right. I mean, I was really thinking about this problem because I was, I was building a lot of larger scale applications at the time. And one of the things that I saw myself constantly repeating was, you know, two things. Um, an object relational mapping solution had to be chosen um, or, or devised or just acknowledged that I wasn't going to use an object relational mapping solution and I had to write the, the SQL myself, right? Um, and the other piece was the history. I was constantly having uh, use case and requirement pieces that involved history. Um, you know, you guys are working on uh, projects to do with MapCushion right now, so that was actually right along the same timeline. And, uh, you know, that was one of the projects that it had to keep a track of, you know, all the historical movements of people. It had to know, um, you know, how their user accounts evolved through time. They, we wanted history on that. Uh, so that, that's just one solution uh, that this was important for. I also had a, a project where I was working on creating a, um, an ERP software. I think that came uh, like a couple of years later, uh, but around the same time. And... You know, I had a, a few of these big projects, and they all had similar uh, requirements. And normally when I, I encounter those situations, that's when I like to take a pause moment and say, okay, what can I build here? You know, I'll spend a little bit extra time up front building something because I know I'm going to reuse it. And when I looked at this problem, the, this compounded problem of, of the object relational mapping solution, because I really didn't like hibernate, and I found myself working 
almost always in the JVM back then. Um, I work now also in, in Node and JavaScript, uh, but I still do work on the JVM a lot, especially uh, with like Play Framework. Uh, but back then I was building almost everything either in Play Framework or I was building uh, straight Java and running it on Tomcat. Um, and, you know, so I knew a JVM based library was a good solution and I didn't like Hibernate and I wanted to kind of work on a, a really lightweight ORM platform. And I said, but you know what, if I'm doing ORM, why can't I involve, um, you know, the history part? Why can't I bring that in at this point? That, that seemed natural to me. As I said on the last slide, um, it never even occurred to me to try to, to fix in some universal way this auditing problem using SQL because it just seems like an unnatural fit for me. I mean, it makes sense uh, for the researchers looking into it because you want to, you know, fix this uh, as close to or in the level where it applies, right? Because then any software sitting on top gets the benefit. It just never seemed to me like the solution that would work. So I never even explored it. I didn't actually know what a temporal database was it, in the term temporal database uh, when I created uh, the 40F lib library. I just knew that I wanted to support auditing, right? So I actually read up on, on temporal uh, databases later, um, you know, as I became more of a teacher and a researcher, uh, and I explored the areas that I like because I, my career brought me down those paths, um, that's when I actually started to say, oh, look, there's all this research um, to this effect. Um, and, you know, that's pretty cool because now I can connect the dots and, um, you know, dig a little bit deeper uh, on those fronts. So I think that working at the JVM level as a library is a more natural solution. And that's where kind of 40F lib starts. It's not at the SQL level like everything uh, we've discussed, but it tackles the same problem. It's just done at the language level. So the idea here is that we're going to give this library and it's going to encapsulate all of those database calls uh, so it can manage the time pieces. If we go back here and we look at you know, transaction time and what are the requirements um, that we can't update, we can't delete, right? All of these things. Um, by encapsulating it and only talking to the database through the 40F lib library, then we guarantee that we can keep these things in effect, right? Now, of course, if you go around the library and you make a direct connection or you don't use the library or you don't use its its service layer or whatever, then obviously you can, you know, circumvent it. And, uh, and I can't necessarily prevent that, um, but that goes against uh, the whole idea, right? The whole idea is that you're not going to circumvent it. So what we wanted to do, and, and this is before I even was referring to it as transactional time, what the, the point of 40F Lib was is to give you this second dimension in time for everything that you do in your data store. Doesn't matter if you even think it needs it or not, it's going to have it. And the idea here was that eventually you could, you know, rewind uh, time and you could see the application as it was at any given moment in time, um, you know, and I actually had an idea where I wanted like the, the UI to have like the slider um, for the date, you know, and it was like the current date or, you know, you could even technically go to the future if you actually had future dates in there. Um, and if you moved it to say like a year before, everything you're looking at would present as if it was that time, you know, regardless if it was, you know, um, a screen with had your course information or whatever, whatever it was, your, your, your user record, anything could just be rewound and all of the context around it would match, right? And that's the big thing because most systems nowadays, even when they do have history for required auditing, the context doesn't match, right? They only have the table that they really, really cared about and the rest of it is just point in time. So how do we do this? So how do we kind of make this uh, common ability to have every single entity um, you know, managed for time? 
Remember when you create, and this was in the, the previous videos where I kind of demo setting this up, when you create a 40F uh, lib application, you are um, giving it an array of your objects that extend common state, right? And common state is this. Common state is a superclass that includes these attributes. RID is a universal row ID. If you've, I think I mentioned this in the other video, if you've used Oracle, uh, it's very similar to Oracle's row ID. The idea here is that this value is always unique. It's always given to you in your table, whether you asked for it or not. Um, it is that long, in this case, value, auto incrementing, um, not null, always unique uh, value, right? And if you have 10 records for me, because I've changed 10 times through the time that I've been in that database, I will have 10 different row IDs. But I will have one of the next thing. I will have one ID. So an ID would represent each entity as it moves through time. Uh, the current flag is set when the, the record you're looking at is, is the current one. The delete flag is set um, if it's deleted, which, which can be current, by the way. Um, and then your ARSD and your ARED are the start and end date of that record. And I know this is a little bit of a review, but it's worth saying twice. Um, the uh, active record end date is null if you're in the current record. Uh, any other record um, is uh, the start date and end date are, you know, the times from uh, which to two that that was the, the current thing. So what we're looking at here in dimension of time, remember, is uh, we're looking at the period, right, which we also know could be called the interval. So um, the ARSD uh, and the ARED offer us this way to create a period. Now remember, the current one is still a period, it's just that you can assume the end date, um, since it's null, uh, reflects the current time, right? Um, that's not how the code kind of deals with it under the covers, but it's how we can mentally say, yes, it's still a period. It's the period from when it started to now, right? Um, the EU ID, again, is a user ID. Um, we're not gonna worry about that too much in this class, um, but basically this is a way to say, who for your auditing record, who entered this record. Um, and the SID, the ESID is the system that edited the record. So I think I mentioned this in the other video, but if you have an Android app and it connects to your database through an API, or you have an iPhone app, or you have a web app, or you have you know, a Fitbit app or whatever, an Apple Watch app, all of those different apps might have different system IDs and they might have a registered user and then you can keep track of which system and which user is actually making the changes to these um, these records, right? That that's basically the idea here. Uh, the other thing that's that's not listed in that box, and it, it should be there, is the tenant ID. Uh, so it is there on on the right hand side. We're looking at the code as well. Um, the tenant ID is how we deal with multi-tenant. So, you know, if you have three tenants, uh, you might have tenant ID one, two, and three. And when we do queries, um, by default, most queries are going to be done uh, with a tenant record in, in mind. But you'll see as we go through this, there's actually overloaded methods for that. So when you do a query for, like, say, get all users, unless you're not using the tenant facility and you only have one tenant, you're gonna to wanna to use the overloaded method that passes in the tenant ID. Um, so you can do that by you know looking to see what your current tenant ID or something is like that, or you can just pass it in if you know what it is. Um, all right, so another concept that I mentioned about 40F lib that is worth repeating and kind of digging into a little bit more is how now it deals with at the service level and at the model the kind of abstraction for creating um, database tables out of our classes without any of uh, you know knowledge ahead of time about what our classes are going to be right so my user table 
um, and your user table could be completely two different things. Like hopefully not for map cushion because I, you know, I, I laid out exactly what's in a map cushion user for the most part. But but think outside of the map cushion bubble for a while. Like you're just building a an app, right? And you're you're building you know your widget app or whatever. Um, your tables are going to be unique to your problem, and they're not going to have anything to do with mine. And we might have some overlapping tables, right? Like a user is a very common table. A role is a very common table. Um, you know, depending on uh, the domain that you're working in, like education or um, finance, there's going to be certain names that repeat all the time, right? Like, um, so that's okay. But even in those repeating areas, we're still going to engineer two very different things. So how does uh, and a library like 40F lib accept any object that we throw at it and be able to create a database table out of it and be able to query it and all those good things. And the answer is uh, reflection, which is a Java API that allows us to examine the object, look at the attributes inside the object, look at their types, and then we basically say, okay, well, you know, this thing is a string, so I'm going to save that as either a text or a var car or whatever. Uh, this thing is an integer, so I'm going to save that as an int. Um, this thing is a is a date, so I'm going to save it as a timestamp or however I decide, right? So basically, that's how it works. It's this ability to look at an object. Um, you, if you've worked in JavaScript, it's very similar an idea to uh, the prototype of the object. Um, in Java, we can use reflection for that. And if you look at this uh, kind of enhanced blown up part at the top here where it says S extends common state, what you're looking at there is basically in, in reflection, you're saying, I'm going to have a uh, type uh, that's going to be passed to me. So you're going to give me the type. And you can actually see over here, uh, this is for the return, that I'm going to return this thing, but I also pass it in, right? So this, let, let's start with the passing it in and then we'll kind of like talk about it going back out. Uh, this function here, the save function, accepts two things. It accepts a state of, of a type, which we actually just are referring to as S. And then it also expects a class um, and it's going to expect a class to be given to it that's basically going to have um, the, the type attached to it. And if I'm passing that in, what that actually looks like, if it's a, say I have a user object and that's actually what I want to pass in, it'll be user.class, that second parameter, is what I'm going to pass in there. And the first one will be the actual user object. It'll be the actual thing that I want to save. And that type S there is now, if we look on the on this side here, we have basically what we're saying here is that I'm going to pass you something of this type, S, and all I'm saying here is that S extends common state. So S is a class, like uh, our user or whatever it is, but it's going to, as it's super class, it's going to have common state. So that's what we're saying here, that whatever you give me, it's got to have common state. Now, why do I do that? Because all of uh, the things that I need to know at the global level are in common state. I need to know that I'm going to give it a row ID. Well, you're going to have one because you have common state. I need to know that I can give it an ID. You're going to have one. I need to know that I can query by ID. I know you have one because it's in common state. I need to query by dates. I know you have them because I, you have ARSD and ARED, right? All of those things that I need at the global level to say that I can do these functions to every single object that you want to persist are there in common state. So if it extends common state, I know it has it. And what I'm doing here in the actual um, the function here is actually calling another version of that function. I just wanted to use this because I really wanted to explain um, the actual uh, you know, signature of the method to kind of talk through reflection points. Um, this is obviously an overloaded method call that calls another version of save, um, and that's okay. Um, but I'm not, if you want to see what that looks like, you can actually uh, go to 
you know, the GitHub and, and go to that other um, uh, method call there where it does save with the state, the entity state, uh, the state.euid, the esid, et cetera, and the tenant ID. Um, but I just wanted to talk through the reflection piece. So let's look at now how this data looks. So we've talked a little bit about how we store it insofar as having those fields in our class, in every class, because they extend my, um, a common state. Um, and then we're going to have a service layer that we can use to make these calls because we need to encapsulate. Remember, we need to encapsulate all of this um, so that the users aren't issuing the SQL calls themselves because we can't leave it up to them and we shouldn't leave it up to them to create proper records historically, right? The system knows how to do that. That's how it's going to do it universally. Um, so let's look at some things that we would normally want to do and how we do them in 40F lib. So this for, first example here is just a very, uh, you know, broad, you want to get everything in the table, right? Select star from users. Now, the equivalent of this in uh, 40F lib is get all, right? There's also a get all with history. Um, and, and, you know, sometimes it's just get all. Actually, I think get all is with history. Um, there's also a get all current which would just return um, the, the current object and not the history. And I think we saw that a little bit in the last video. This one I know is everything because again, it has a list of FDF entity. And remember we said, whoops, that FDF entity uh, implies that we have that wrapper object that includes the current state and a list of all the historical states, right? So that's how this is gonna come back to me. But let's, what I really care about there here, because we did talk about that last time, is to, to actually look at the table data now. I want you to see what comes back here. So if we look at row ID 1 here, uh, this is for user ID 1. So this was uh, our first unique user. This record that we're looking at is no longer current, so this is a historical record. It hasn't been deleted, um, so it's, it's a valid historical record. It has a start date of uh, March 1st, 2015, and it was valid between then and March 19th, 2015. Uh, it had a user in, in system ID of one. Those were just gonna kinda uh, move past. Um, and there's no tenant ID shown here, but we'll just always assume that the tenant ID is one here. Um, and my first name was Brian, and my last name was Gorma. So apparently there was a, an error there and my middle name was, was E. Okay, great. Now the second one has row ID two, and remember row ID is gonna change no matter what. ID two, so this is a different user. Uh, it is current, so notice it has a start date of, of the 4th of March um, in 2015, but no end date. Uh, and the first name is Henry, and the last name is the eighth. So this is, we, we would expect, since this is the current row, and ID2, we would expect not to see any other ID2s in here, and I don't, right? Uh, the third one is ID3, cool, so a different user. It is also current, um, and the name here is Kenneth Thompson. Okay, great. And let's go on to the fourth row here. So we have row ID4. Notice that the ID here is 1, so this is, in fact, tied to me. This is the same as this guy here. They do have different row IDs, but they have the same ID. And again, not current, not deleted, uh, was valid from the 19th, right when this happened, right? So this row was valid after this one, and its period goes to a day later, uh, 320. Uh, it looks like the name is spelt correctly here, Brian Gormanly, um, and that's the change there. So you can see that my name changed. Now, you might be thinking to yourself, hey, you know, like, isn't this violating normal form? What about update and delete anomalies? And if you're thinking that, that's that's a really good thought, but it's not um, a correct one. And the reason why is because of the time dimension. We're not actually, remember, updating these things. So if I had multiple rows with my name in it, right, that would be a red flag. I've got multiple rows that talk to the same user 
Um, so I've got here, I've got another one right below it here where my middle name is in it, right? Is that the current one? Yeah, let's let's just talk through this one and then we can add the three of them together because it's apparently the current. So I have a third row now for the same user, row 85, ID 1, current flag is 1, so no end date. It was current from here, so this one took over there, and I have a spelled out middle name. So this is my current record. This is what I look like at this moment in time, still to this day, because this has never had an end date uh, in this database. So if you looked up my record and you just looked at the current one, that's what you'd see. Now, what's important to note here, though, is this is not the same as update and delete anomalies, because these records are actually different. They only apply to myself as a user in those times. So you can think of the time here as part of the key right um, and you're not duplicating the data because they are actually representing what the data was supposed to look like at that time so if I were to update this row I'm not actually issuing an updated anomaly because I would not be having update the previous rows because they're not supposed to change right so it is in fact different even though it might feel like we're violating normal form there um, we might be, you know, violating third normal form in some ways because of, you know, the way that we add extra attributes for convenience or stuff like that, depending on how we roll this out. But we're not actually doing it just on pure, you know, update, um, delete anomalies because we're duplicating data. We're not actually duplicating data. We're only adding data as it appears in future or past time frames. And that data is as it was supposed to be at that time. And that's the important piece to remember. All right, so now we have, uh, after that, we have a couple here for ID4. So this is a new user, uh, one that is uh, current, actually three. So we have three for our user four here, one, two, three. This one is current. So this is Donald Duck. His middle name's Quack. Um, before that, he was accidentally put in as Mickey Duck without a K, um, and before that, he was Donald Duck with uh, still without a K. So, so that's how that one progressed. Currently, uh, Donald is, is spelt correctly, and then we have this last one here that's all by itself uh, as far as only having the one record. It is current, um, and that's Happy Gilmore. Um, so, you know, that's those are all our records. If we were to do a um, get uh, all on this, it would return all of these things. Records like Donald Duck and me would have a current record and historical records for all of the ones that have end dates. And records like Happy Gilmore would only have a current record and their list of historical records would just be empty. So if you check the size of that list, it would just be empty because there is no history yet. It's just the current one. Let's look at another example here. Uh, this one is to get all current, very similar to what we were discussing before, except now we don't want to get those FDF entities because we're not doing anything with history, so we'd rather keep it simple. So in this case, we're just going to return a list of the type. So you're literally going to get back a list of type user here um, instead of a list of FDF entity of type user. And that just means that when it creates them, it's just returning that single array and not putting it inside FDF entity um, along with the history. So uh, you're only going to get back those current rows. So here I am with my, my correctly spelt name. Donald is, is correct. He's not Mickey or, and he doesn't, he doesn't, he's not missing his K here. Um, happy is obviously happy because he's only got one row. Um, but this is just a point in time. Um, using things like this, get all current, is, is very common um, because you don't necessarily want to introduce the extra load of um, you know bringing in all the history and all the memory because who knows how many historical rows you might have unless the user is actually digging into that. So, like if you had that uh, slider I was I was talking about at the top of the UI. Um, where you could kind of like rewind time. Well, the moment the user uses that slider, or maybe you lazy loaded it, then you could go back and get the history, right? But when you're just showing the, the regular form, 90 
five times out of a hundred, probably what people actually care about is the current stuff. So, you know, just get the current stuff. Also want to point out, um, you know, there's also indexes thrown in on things like ID. And that's super important for, for a query like this, because remember, obviously adding all these historical rows to your table is going to make it a lot bigger. It could slow it down. Um, but adding indexes is a good way to speed this up. So indexes on these key fields that we're going to be working with, like RID, ID, R, uh, ARSD, and ARED, um, and, and tenant ID are very important, right? So the system can do that. And in doing that, um, you know, at the global 40F lib level, uh, all the applications that use it uh, get to, to live that advantage. And it shouldn't honestly slow them down that much. That said, I'm sure there are use cases where uh, this would be bad. If you predict that you're going to have, you know, billions of rows of data because of the time element, well, you know, you're just going to have to, if, if it's that important to your use case, uh, then you just have to work uh, through that, figure out if it's if it is feasible to do this way, or if you need another solution. Uh, but I think for you know the vast majority of applications out there, this format would fit quite nicely. And I don't think the extra rows are going to be detrimental in the real world under normal situations, right? And if you're outside of that kind of umbrella of the majority of use cases, absolutely sure. I mean, that's always going to be the case. But I really do think that um, this, especially when you take into account the indexing and how the queries are written and encapsulated, um, you know, I really do think that this can be done um, without any if any real loss performance wise uh, versus not having the history for the majority of use cases. Um, here's another example of a of a service. So this is to get the entity, um, uh, the current entity again, just just like before. But this time we just want one, right? So we want uh, one by ID. So we're getting here um, the ID four. Uh, apparently uh, I. I accidentally grabbed, sorry about this, I accidentally grabbed the wrong code. I shouldn't have grabbed the get entity current by ID. I should have just grabbed the get entity by ID because this also returned history. Um, so just uh, imagine that this current isn't here uh, and it returns here, uh, not just the type S, but an FDF entity of type S um, because this this doesn't match the output. So, uh, this is the same idea, except now, you know, like under the scenes, this is actually adding a where clause uh, where ID equals four. And uh, it's it's important to note that if you don't want the deleted rows, uh, you have to have DF equals zero. Now, again, this you never write the query, right? You just that's the beauty of it. You just use the APIs and the APIs know to do this for you. Uh, the only time you need to know this is if you guys are doing option two and you want to actually uh, create these queries for a new database. Um, but the deleted flag is, uh, did I have any in here that were deleted? I don't think I did. Oh, I did. Look at that. Oh, so Mickey Duck, because that was a, let's say that was a, a tragic accident, right? Um, notice here that actually Mickey doesn't come back. So I think that's actually why I had that example. I forgot about that. So if you look at, at Donald here, so uh, ID four, right? I have four or uh, three rows. I have uh, Donald Duck missing the K. I have Mickey Duck missing the K. And then I have Donald Duck spelled correctly, right? But if you look here, what came back, Mickey Duck isn't here. Now, the reason why, so, so the intended use of this is we said we don't want to ever delete anything, right? But we know in the real world, sometimes you have to. Like, what if I, you know, was HR and I accidentally gave someone a salary of a million bucks and, you know, obviously that would have made them very happy, but I would have lost my job um, and it was an error. So I returned them to their normal salary, uh, but, you know, that historical record would show up here, right? Because um, it's it's there for all eternity. Well, what a deleted flag does, you can still delete, but it doesn't actually remove the row. It sets the deleted flag as you see here. So notice here that this deleted flag is set. So for auditing purposes, and there are special um, 
service calls that actually do auditing and they return things with deleted flags set. Uh, but for normal use on the UI, you, if you deleted something, you don't want it to show up. So the data is still here. There's continuity for the auditing process, uh, but the UI will not show data that is like, I don't want to say harmful, but you intended not to be seen. So you've now since marked it as deleted, right? So that's what the deleted flag does. And that's worked into this example here. Um, another example is what if we want to get users at a certain uh, time period? So you can ask for users between a range of uh, time or you can ask for at an instance of time. So there are uh, queries to like get user at a time and between times. So uh, you can, in this example here, we're doing it uh, where it's uh, between the, the start date and the end date of uh, basically one day, it looks like. Um, but you can make that a bigger range if you want more or a smaller range. And this gives you that snapshot, right? So at that date and time, this is what the world looked like. It looked just like this. And there are methods for this. Um, you just pass it a date. You say, I want this at date. And you pass it in a date. Um, and then you get back that slice of time. What did it look like then? Um, updates, I just want to kind of like look at so how this actually works. So what we're looking at here is a, a the actual code. And you can look at this again in, uh, in GitHub if you're curious to learn more. I just pulled out kind of the most pertinent code. Um, this is when I actually save a record. Uh, what it does is it first looks to see, um, you know, does this entity have a current record? Um, and if, if it uh, does, then we're going to take that current record because that means that there was already something that was current, right? Before the thing I'm about to save, there was a previous current. So I'm going to take that and I'm going to just temporarily hold it in this last current state. Um, and then I'm going to massage that by setting the end date because now that last current state is going to have the current end date. Um, and then I'm going to set its current flag um, obviously to false because it's no longer current. And then I'm going to my, my API, like the code inside the API, you never do this yourself, right? Um, is going to actually issue an update to that row to change, uh, the row. The only time it updates anything is to change that end date and change the current flag, um, or add a delete flag, but the data itself is never changed. So like you saw with like the Mickey duck, right? Even though we deleted Mickey duck and set its delete flag, the actual text remains, right? That's that audit trail. Uh, 40F lib still wants to make sure it can recreate the world and exactly what it looked like uh, in the purview of that database at that time. Um, and then we go ahead and save the new record um, into uh, the system. So we go ahead and do an insert uh, for the new entity state and that will become the new current, right? Once that is persisted. So what wasn't current gets pushed into history after getting its end date and its current flag changed and, and um, there's a separate code to deal with the delete mechanism. And then the new state gets pushed in as an insert, and that's how uh, when you query for that later, you get it as a current. Um, here is actually the, the delete flag code itself. Uh, so here's actually, it's a call to that audit um, function I was mentioning before. So that's how you get all raw data, like, you know, including the deletes. Um, and again, you, you call these APIs, right? Anything that's not public, then it's not intended for you to call directly, right? Um, and then basically what it's going to do here is, is it takes the entity that it gets back uh, because we asked for it by ID um, for the tenant and then it takes it and it gets its most recent state and then it marks it deleted. It sets that deleted state to uh, true and then it resaves it, right? So that's pretty straightforward, but you can kind of see how uh, 40flib deals with the entities. 
Um, and now remember, because we're using reflection, this entity can be of any class that, that you have, right? I don't even know, I don't know what your classes will be ahead of time. I have no idea, right? Um, you could be building like, you know, the chimney sweep database. I, I just don't know. And you, you care about, you know, um, chimney sweep tools and types of chimneys and addresses and bills, right? Great, cool. And all of those things will be passed in as S, right? They'll all be some class type that's passed in. Um, what I'm working with here, notice, are all of those common state elements that because it extends common state, uh, I know it'll have. And beyond that, there's a whole, there's more to reflection. Like if, if you go for option two, um, the real deep dive on reflection is then um, when you build out, especially like when you create the tables um, or you need to query from them, uh, but really when you build them out, you need to dissect a new class. Like, so if we had that uh, chimney sweep one that we just mentioned and one of our tables was like, you know, um, types of uh, chimney types or something, you know, attributes there might have to do with, you know, I don't know how, how tall the chimney is and uh, if it's made of wood or if it's made of brick or uh, what its dimensions are or um, how, what the diameter of the flue is. I don't know. I mean, I'm making stuff up. I don't know much about chimneys. Um, but that's the kind of stuff that reflection then actually looks at your class. You pass in the class and reflection actually iterates through its members and it says, okay, you know, I found this, um, diameter field for the flu and it's of type, uh, float, you know, so I'm going to create an attribute with this SQL data type. And that's the code that's marked in those files uh, that I pointed out in the other video if you're interested in option two. Um, so that's, that's what I wanted to touch on here. I wanted to just really focus in on the time element uh, with 40F lib. Hopefully that kind of uh, brings it into a little bit of more clarity because that's a, a major part of the, the final pieces of your project, right? You have to use 40F lib to create the data store and you'll see that work, but then you have to insert data and you have to, to show it coming back out. Um, so I think between this and the actual uh, demo application that I gave you, the black car service, I'm hoping that, you know, between these two things, uh, you'll have more than enough to, to get going. But Please remember, first stop for discussion is always the forums, so I have an opportunity to answer it uh, for everyone. And also, I guarantee, if, if you have the question, I guarantee probably someone else does too. Uh, it doesn't happen all the time, but it does happen uh, the majority of the time. So that's it for this week. Uh, I have uh, the, the document posted uh, that goes deeper. I have links to resources uh, for temporal databases, and I will see you next week.